lecture uh, of this session will be delivered by Dr. Arge Das on the topic constitutive model of geomaterial addressing plasticity. Dr. Das is presently working as an associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, India. So he had pursued his PhD from University of Sydney, Australia. Then he joined Northwestern University, USA as a postdoctoral research fellow and joined IIT Kanpur as an associate assistant professor in 2014. His research domain includes constitutive modeling of geomaterial, micromechanics of granular materials, flow through porous media, bifurcation and instability analysis in geomaterials, and numerical and physical modeling in geotechnical engineering. So I uh, re request Dr. Das to please take over the session. Okay. Just one minute. Uh, we are already been delayed. So Dr. Das, we have buffer time. So feel free to cover your material. So as much as long time that takes, uh, probably we can disperse for lunch late. So we can take 130 even if it is required. Thank you. I hope participants won't mind. Okay. Thank you, Madhushudan, for the introduction and thank you, Mushumi, uh, for the letting me know. Uh, okay, let me share my slide. Just a moment. I hope it is visible. Okay. Okay, um, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Argo. I'm from IIT Kanpur. So today I'm uh, going to talk about uh, the topic uh, constructive models for uh, geomaterials addressing uh, plasticity. So in this talk, uh, where uh, Professor Jiang already mentioned many of the things uh, today morning, uh, followed by uh, Dr. Moushumi already gave a very nice introduction uh, for elasticity as well as the continuum mechanics. So those, I'll bank on those uh, uh, knowledge and try to build upon from there onwards. So here I mentioned geomaterials. Uh, I'll primarily cover granular materials like sand, and uh, at the end, we'll also talk about uh, other geometries like clay as well. Okay. So please feel free to ask if you have any question, any doubt uh, at any time. I'll rather go a little bit of uh, slow because this is a very heavy topic. I, as I was discussing with uh, Professor Moshmi yesterday also. This is almost a full semester course. We are, uh, we are, are covering in, in one day sessions. So uh, let's see how we can uh, give a justice to that. So to begin with, I'll, I'll start with a, a plot, uh, which uh, partly Professor Mushmi already shown in her presentation. So this is a triaxial test response uh, for sand as well as uh, clay type of material. Now, the point is, if you look at it very carefully, there are a couple of things to notice. One of them is uh, there is a marked elasticity. We are talking about the clay type of material. Initially, there is the elastic part. And then uh, this beyond that uh, elastic part, depending on the type of uh, boundary or boundary condition, as well as the type of material, the behavior starts changing. Okay, so this plot is basically a deviated stress, which we generally known as the sigma three minus sigma one when we are doing the triaxial test. Uh, we make uh, sigma three or the cell pressure constant, and then uh, apply deviated load, and then with that deviated stress strain response is plotted here. And uh, when we are uh, yeah. so, if you look, there are four plots here. So now these four plots are primarily uh, two are undrained and two are drained. And when you are talking about the clay, uh, 
the very important aspect is this over consolidation ratio for OCR. So if it is a normally consolidated clay uh, where you can see and if you are performing a drain test, uh, it is following a trajectory like this uh, as I am uh, showing in the cursor. And uh, if it is uh, over consolidated, then we can see some sort of a kink uh, kind of uh, behavior and then it starts uh, softening type of response. Okay. So these are the marked difference between over consolidation or normally consolidated. Similarly, if we are going uh, towards the uh, undrained response, when we are closing all the valves and uh, doesn't allow the water or the pore water to go out and uh, allow the pore water to build up, then uh, things will be a little bit different. Then in the clay, uh, again, depending on the type of consolidation, if it is a normal consolidation, then we can see it is going up and then start going down. And if it is over consolidated, it is uh, initial elasticity and then followed by up. Uh, change in the course of the stress strain response. Okay. Similarly, uh, if we are looking, uh, uh, looking at the right hand side of the plot, then there is a sand response. And uh, you may notice that there are certain similarities between this clay response and the sand response in terms of uh, test. Of course, clay has this over consolidation uh, or pre consolidation pressure, which determine whether it is normally consolidated in C clay or OC clay. Whereas in case of drain tape, uh, sorry, in case of sand, uh, we don't have those kind of uh, demarcation. Rather than sand, we prepare the sample in terms of its relative density. So whether it is a dense sand or the loose sand. Now, interestingly, the dense sand response is very nicely or very similar to the over consolidated clay. And the loose sand response is uh, very similar to the uh, normally consolidated. And uh, when it goes to the undrained response, it is also more or less a similar trend uh, we can follow uh, in case of undrained response as well for the sand. So uh, the bottom line is, when we are going for this kind of modeling, we have to understand these two features. Uh, one is the relative density, which is pertaining to sand, and another is the over consolidation ratio, which is pertaining to clay. So those are very important aspects. Now, our objective is uh, here constructive modeling, where uh, Professor Mosley already mentioned what does it mean? It means somehow to come up with a mathematical form or a mathematical equation, at least at this stage, uh, in a continuum level, uh, to determine the relationship between stress and strain and how we connect them through the stiffness. So, in this stiffness calculation, when we have elasticity, uh, sometimes things are very simple. Sometimes it is not even simple because unlike any other material, soil behaves a very uh, nonlinear elastic. Now things go even more complex when we go beyond the elasticity, when there is a permanent deformation, uh, as we can see from these plots, uh, some of the places. Uh, for example, this normally consolidated uh, drain testing clay, we even don't know where uh, yielding actually happens or where permanent deformation starts because the curve is so smooth uh, there is somewhere down the line elasticity ends and plasticity begins something like that so we also need to take care of it so finally for this modeling part we have to take care of this elasticity part which professor mostly gave a very nice detail then followed by where the yielding takes place that we need to figure it out then followed by there is some permanent deformation so called plasticity and that followed by some sort of a failure at the end. Now, when it goes to permanent deformation, there is a plastic flow, which could be hardening, as you know, may be aware of, and that, that could be softening as well. Okay. okay. So, where this constructive modeling actually requires, requires for solving those boundary value problems. For example, I have a figure here, which is showing a mesh of a, let us say, a, a slope is showing here, and it's a finite element mesh. Now, when we are modeling this type of boundary value problems, then essentially what we are doing, uh, we either apply stresses or strain, assume we are applying some sort of a strain or displacement, and under that displacement condition, uh, what is the stress generated or vice versa, that is our objective to uh, achieve from these uh, boundary value problems. But if you look at it a little in detail, 
what is happening if we take any one of the uh, mesh out of it or one of the elements uh, out of it uh, we can see this sort of a behavior where uh, we can see uh, this is an element where uh, the nodes are uh, denoted and within the element there are certain points which is uh, popularly known as the uh, integration points where the main integration takes place now the role of constitutive model actually happens there in this uh, red cross points those are the integration points where we actually input that stress strain response what we observe in in the previous slide, the, the observed from the experiments that we somehow need to insert inside uh, these small uh, integration points so that when the boundary condition changes, different strains are coming from different direction of the displacements are happening, they will all together integrate and give the response of the overall uh, material, which is uh, uh, what Professor Jiang was mentioned the macroscopic response. So the bottom line is uh, we have to figure it out this stress to strain response and uh, which links with this DEP. DEP in this case is nothing but the uh, elastoplastic stiffness. If it is fully elastic, then this is the elastic stiffness. And if there is a plasticity involved, then it combines. We have to figure it out uh, how would be the form of elastoplastic stiffness. So I'll go over these things very quickly. So uh, this invariant uh, definition, stress, stress definitions, uh, stress tensor, Professor motion already gave a bit of detail. So what I'm going to do primarily, uh, in case of soil mechanics, we very much familiar or uh, with uh, this deviatoric stress and the volumetric stress or the mean stress, and correspondingly the deviatoric strain or shear strain and the volumetric strain. So one uh, is responsible for its uh, shape change and another is responsible for the uh, change of its volume. So instead of working with all the nine uh, stress components or the six stress, uh, uh, stress components, we can uh, actually reduce it down sometimes to the principal stress component, sometimes depending on the boundary condition, we can make it axisymmetric considering the actual and radial stresses, or uh, we can go ahead with the uh, invariant definition like P and Q, the degree and the volume. Similarly, we can do the same thing for the strain and volume. Right. So now these are the uh, simple transformation uh, where if we are talking about axial or radial stresses, which can be also transformed into the P and Q, P and Q, P is the volumetric or the mean stress and Q is the degree stress. Uh, similarly, the volumetric strain and the deviatoric or distortion strain can be uh, classified. So, the definition in case of axisymmetric condition, P is nothing but uh, the sum of or the trace of that stress uh, matrix, or here uh, the, we can define in terms of the sigma A plus twice sigma R divided by 3, and the deviatoric stress is sigma A minus sigma R. Volumetric strain is the, the summation of all the three different strain in three different directions and distortional strain is two third of sigma a minus sigma sorry epsilon a minus epsilon r uh, remember this is under axisymmetric condition otherwise the equation is a little bit large as uh, professor was uh, mentioning in the in her presentation uh, in continuum mechanics or in case of general solid uh, solid mechanics sometimes we we use this uh, conventional invariant uh, notations like i1 uh, by 3, I1 is the trace and uh, J2 root 3 J2. So they can be easily uh, interchangeable to P and Q. So please uh, 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 note this notation. So P and Q are the one that I'll primarily discuss uh, throughout this talk. Now coming to the basic test, because uh, when, as I mentioned, when we are going to develop some sort of a model, then uh, we need to uh, get the idea about the characteristics of the material and that we can obtain from the tests and whatever the test responses are that test responses we need to uh, fit or we need to formulate as a mathematical form uh, through the constructive models now if we go by the basic uh, uh, definitions or the basic boundary condition so if for example odometer odometer compression or so-called consolidation test what we used to do we have a ring 
and uh, we place the sample and then we keep on apply the load and there's the excess pore water pressure and eventually the pore water pressure dissipates and the material settles. But uh, if we go by the mechanical boundary condition, uh, we are having a fixed ring in the autometer. So basically your radial strain has a constraint there. So there is no radial strain. So this is the main boundary condition here. Besides the drainage boundary, I'm not talking about the drainage boundary at this moment. Coming to the drain triaxial test or so-called CD test, consolidated drain triaxial test, the main boundary condition is your cell pressure or the radial stress. So the radial stress is constant. That means during the test period or when you are applying the deviatory load, your cell pressure is constant. That means the change of cell pressure is low. That is one of the major boundary condition there to simulate that kind of test. And when it comes to undrained test, uh, the main uh, part is when we are closing the valves and we allow the pore pressure to build up. But inherently what we are trying to do by putting water inside the sample, the we are not allowing the sample to change any of the any of its volume. So technically, uh, because water is also incompressible and we can think of the individual solid drains are incompressible. So when you are closing the hull, overall your sample volume is not changed. So uh, instead of writing it your pore pressure or the closing the valve, I can write it down uh, the boundary condition for this type of test as the constant uh, volume type of test. Your change of volume is zero. Okay? These are the main boundary conditions. Now coming to the plasticity part, since Professor uh, uh, Moshin already discussed about the elasticity, uh, I'll start with the plasticity. Now there are challenges involved plasticity uh, because when we are talking about the soil, there is no such uh, very clear demarcation sometimes. So where plasticity begins and the plastic response is not necessarily linear. And there are other uh, associated problems or I must say complexities are there. What are the complexities? One is non-linearity. So the stiffness, the stiffness means if you look at any of this plot uh, below, uh, let us assume somewhere uh, there is a change in the, the or there is a transition between elasticity to plasticity, but this plasticity is not linear. It is going a non-linear path. So if you take a tangent at any point, this tangent is keep on changing. There is an irreversibility involved. Irreversibility in the sense uh, you can unload, load. Sometimes they are not following the same path also. So you need to unload it and load it back. A classic example is when you are performing autometer test. We, we, we often perform unloading and loading test. And you will see, depending on the type of material, if it's clay, then this autometer loading and loading loop is quite high. And uh, when it's sand, it is uh, something very narrow. So this type of irreversibility also uh, involves. I mean, they are not following the same path, as well as the plastic strain is also there. Uh, there is incremental nonlinearity, which implies uh, the responses or uh, the loading and loading responses are uh, differences which I already mentioned. And there is a history dependency, which is another crucial aspect. History dependency is nothing but our pre-consolidation pressure. So we know that uh, when we are taking a sample, if the sample is already loaded in the earlier and uh, its pre-consolidation pressure changes, then uh, initially if we apply a load, it will Try to behave like elastic until and unless my load reaches to that pre-consolidation pressure and then beyond that it will again start deforming. So there is a soil is that's why we sometimes call it a smart material because there is a some sort of history it can uh, store until and unless if we completely remold the soil and uh, come up with a new sample but uh, it preserved that history. So I mentioned earlier for example for the clay type of sample so when we are modeling this plasticity, this history dependency or this OCR or over consolidation ratio effect also we need to take into account uh, for modeling. So these are the some of the complexities how we can uh, model soil. I hope uh, uh, so far things are well. I mean, uh, please feel free to ask if you, if you have. Okay, so coming to the soil plasticity. Now, in general, for plasticity, not necessarily for soil plasticity, there are three or four things uh, we need to know. One is for the classical uh, modeling approach. One is the limit of elasticity. That means 
as I was mentioning, there is a short change or there is a transition from the elastic to plastic. So that change uh, we need to identify. Uh, we need to not only uh, we need to identify the change, then we have to figure it out what is that threshold. Uh, so what is the limit of that uh, uh, threshold where the change happens? And beyond that change, there is a plastic flow takes place, which again for any general material uh, that also happens. The metals also it happens. So that plastic flow also uh, we need to uh, take into account or uh, measure it for measuring the plastic uh, strain. So in our uh, probably undergrad uh, understanding, you may have heard about uh, this thing that uh, what are the different type of uh, responses uh, for any material we found. Uh, these responses uh, is not necessarily for the soil, it can be for metals, it can be for any other material. If you, uh, we can idealize the stress strain response uh, beyond elasticity, either it is a completely uh, perfectly plastic, that means it go elastic and then followed by plastic. And it may happen that sometimes it can go elastic, that means it reaches to the threshold and after the transition, it may be uh, go hardening, it may be go softening, okay? And uh, these behaviors can be easily uh, modeled uh, using a simple uh, spring slider system. So, for example, if you have a spring which is elastic and it is uh, connected to a mass M, so when you are pulling the spring, the spring will initially expand, expand, and then beyond a certain threshold, when the friction between the uh, this mass and its base uh, overcomes, then the mass will start moving, and then you will start having a permanent deformation. You are losing, I mean, initially during the elasticity, you are conserving your energy, but the moment you are uh, crossing that threshold, uh, you are kind of dissipating. Okay. Similarly, for the hardening softening response, we can idealize uh, it as a uh, dual spring mechanism in which, again, you are initially pushing it, but uh, beyond which when it uh, when your threshold uh, crosses then also but uh, you should not only pulling it continuously but because of that uh, another spring associated uh, with it you can have some sort of an additional uh, hardening or additional stress gain uh, within the system so that uh, may result in some sort of hardening but these are very idealized type of situation uh, through which, but this gives a very nice background or very nice uh, understanding how to model uh, the plasticity uh, for any material. So, when we are modeling, so we first discuss this elastic perfectly plastic. That means when it reaches to that threshold and afterwards it's just failing. Okay, there is no increase in any further stresses, so there is a failure, and this failure can be determined by various type of failure criteria. Now, one of the earliest failure criteria uh, has been defined uh, by Henry Tresca, and this is uh, nothing but uh, known as the Tresca failure criteria, though we not always uh, use it for the soil mechanics, except a few cases, uh, which uh, says the difference of the stress, uh, the principal stresses, uh, it's half. So, whenever uh, any of this sigma 1 minus sigma 2 by 2 or sigma 2 minus sigma 3 by 2 or sigma 3 minus sigma 1 by 2 reaches a certain value k, uh, we demark it there is that is the failure or that is your so called threshold. Now, uh, this feature can actually be drawn in a, in a 2D uh, scenario. So, this is a 2D scenario you can see in the left hand side, uh, sorry, in the right hand side, the sigma 1, sigma 2 plane. If we draw that, this uh, failure criteria. It took, uh, it took this kind of a hexagonal type of a shape. And if we uh, plot the same thing in a three dimensional condition, then uh, we can see a hexagonal, uh, not only the hexagonal shape, but with a cylindrical uh, system or a cylindrical surface we can see. And the cylinder is basically per parallel, uh, it's perpendicular to the octahedral plane and it's parallel to the I1 or that uh, first invariant of the stress axis or P axis, uh, I can say. Okay, so this is the risk of failure criteria. But uh, the thing is that uh, this kind of failure criteria uh, is not uh, friction dependent. Okay, so for example, in the case of soil, 
uh, we know that it is a fictional material. So whenever we have got, we have seen in the some of the previous examples. So whenever we are applying a load uh, and, and the material is under contact, and then the more we are compacting it or more we are applying confinement, it is very hard to move that because your friction is keep on increasing because of your confinement. So, but uh, this type of uh, model or this type of failure criteria doesn't account for that. What it accounts, it, it considers that irrespective of your confinement or irrespective of your uh, normal loading condition, your failure remains the constant. Okay, so that is why this is not very popular, except a very few cases uh, we can use it. Uh, similarly, there is another failure criteria. Again, these are all uses primarily for the metal purpose. This is called the J2 failure criteria, or it is the J2 plasticity. We can also say so. This is the von Mises failure criteria. Unlike the previous case, what it suggests that uh, the shape of the failure criteria is now become circular or the in a, in a sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, three dimension plane is uh, considering a kind of a cylindrical type of a surface uh, is generated. Again, it is independent of I or the confining effect. Uh, J2, we definition we already gave. So your basically root three J2 is nothing but the debut at its So if you want to correlate with our soil mechanic convention, so this is how it is. So the point is that, as I was mentioning, these two failure criteria often is considered equivalent, except a very few cases. Uh, they are independent. I mean, they are identical at the uh, topmost uh, uh, nodal uh, position. That means if these three axes are my sigma one, sigma two, and the sigma three axis, and uh, as we are moving along any of the axes, we are basically in an axisymmetric situation, and as we are deviating from that axis then we are in a situation where your all the three principal stresses are different okay so it has been found that in variety of the material so these two are actually providing these two type of material are actually providing two bounds one is the upper bound solution and other is a lower bound type of a solution otherwise uh, uh, they are giving the same solution when it is a uh, asymmetric type of condition so this is one of the uh, classic cases where this failure criteria can be used in the soil mechanics per se, where it is, for example, when we are performing the UU test, okay, unconsolidated unrent. What is happening? We know that when you are performing unconsolidated unrent test, uh, we are uh, kind of uh, applying, we are closing all the bulbs and we are applying the load. So irrespective of your confining pressure, at least theoretically, if your sample is fully saturated, you will see all the more circles are coming identical. So it is irrespective of your confining pressure means. So it is independent of the confining pressure. So to some extent, your Tresca failure criteria can be used in this sort of a uh, situation. If you truly want to model this type of situation, the failure of this type of situation, uh, Tresca can be a uh, way out. So in order to get a more generalized failure criteria for the soil mechanics per se, in order to take into account the frictional effect, normal load, or the confining pressure effect, the most popular failure criteria, which we already learned in our undergrad uh, cases also, which is known as the uh, mohr coulomb type of failure criteria. And if you can see in the mohr coulomb failure criteria, this is the uh, shape of the failure criteria in the our regular tau sigma plane. We can also get the same uh, similar type of shape if we are plotting the same thing in a QP plane, the invariant plane one. In the, in the vertical axis, if you plot Q, and in the horizontal axis, you plot P, then also it will take the same shape. Unlike uh, this case, your instead of a slope is not phi dash, but some function of phi uh, will be there. Okay, so this is now if we uh, look at it, uh, the the mathematical form of it. This is a well-known form. So your tau equals to sigma normal tan phi. If you have a cohesion, it is there. Uh, we can also plot it in terms of our principal stress uh, condition. And in terms of shape, because this particular failure criteria, this uh, mode coulomb, is primarily derived from the Fresca failure criteria, so it also retains some sort of hexagonal type of a shape. Yet, because if it's a I1 dependent or confined pressure dependent, so what we can see, uh, the, the size of this, or the opening of this hexagon, is keep on reducing as your confined pressure is uh, going uh, smaller and smaller. The more your confining pressure is, the hexagon size is bigger. That means you need to give a much amount of load 
uh, to reach this surface to achieve the failure. But if your confining pressure is uh, very small, then your failure will be uh, very early, which is very obvious in case of any uh, frictional granular materials or frictional uh, geometry. A similar attempt uh, uh, was there from a uh, tracker uh, and uh, project. They developed another failure criteria, which is actually a modified version of the von Mises one. So it is similar to our previous Mohr Coulomb, but instead of that hexagonal failure, it is having this sort of a conical type of a shape. That means your von Mises will have cylindrical shape, and this is giving you a conical uh, type of a shape. So, so with that note, I have a, uh, let me see if I can unshare the screen. I can quickly show you how uh, this uh, different failure criteria actually look like. So, I hope uh, my screen is visible. So this is somehow the Tresca failure criteria. This is a uh, looks like a cylindrical shape. I hope it is visible. So it's a cylindrical, but if you look at the cross section wise, it is a kind of a hexagonal type of a shape. Okay, that's how uh, it actually works. Now, if we and this three axis are your sigma one, sigma two, uh, sigma three axis. If we are looking at the uh, Failure criteria, which is known as our so called Drucker Pregger failure criteria, which is having this conical type of shape. The, the cross section is basically circular. That is why it is a Drucker Pregger type of uh, failure criteria. Uh, similarly, if we do, uh, look into our uh, Mohr Coulomb, uh, sorry, the von Mises failure criteria. So, this is the von Mises. You can see the cross section is circular. So, it's a pure, completely a cylindrical situation. And if we go towards the more Coulomb type of failure criteria, this is the cross section of to some extent the more Coulomb type of failure criteria. Okay, so their shapes are changing in this uh, sigma one, sigma two, and uh, sigma three planes depending on uh, what are the criteria. So whether it is only J two J two dependent or whether it is a only I one dependent. Now one uh, thing is that in in, uh, in the last uh, uh, slide or something uh, somebody asked about uh, this uh, the, the uh, effect of this. Uh, so called uh, other invariants like uh, one is the J3 or, or third invariant, how does it look like? So, uh, that third invariant actually, what it does, uh, unlike the perfectly hexagonal shape, they can have some effect on the shape, not only hexagonal, but they make it a slightly circular uh, at the edges or at the corner. Okay, so you can see uh, in this one, I did a, a small tweak in the plot so that you can able to see some sort of a small circular shape you can see it's much better in in the other situation yeah in this situation it is not perfectly circular or not perfectly hexagon but you can see the uh, the shape is slightly changed okay so that is your that uh, uh, third invariant of the db that is just dependency how it actually works okay so uh, I'm stopping it uh, uh, right now and I'll share the slides again. So with that note, uh, we'll start with the uh, soil plasticity. So in case of plasticity, uh, the thing is that we can uh, divide the strains uh, in terms of elastic strain and the plastic strain. We are considering elastic perfectly plastic scenario. I mean, in that case, uh, we have to find out the condition or we have to impose the condition the loading and unloading condition so that uh, if this f is our failure criteria which is of course a function of the stresses as we have already discussed in the previous slide so if that is zero that is then it is a loading criteria and if it is less than zero then it, and del f the derivative uh, is less than zero then it is an unloading criteria that means we are going inside the yield surface and uh, if it is equal to zero, that means it is we are just on the uh, failure surface. Please note that we cannot leave the failure surface uh, during the loading process. We always stick to that failure surface when uh, the loading is uh, going on. Okay. Uh, so this is these are the two conditions we have to uh, remember during the modeling uh, purposes. 
Now, again, the similar condition, we can write it down in the, in, instead of writing in the previous slide, we wrote it in terms of uh, sigma ij, that means the full stress tensor we uh, used. Instead of that, we can use our uh, conventional this PQ definition. That means uh, del F del P because it's a function. I mean, we can write it down in terms of invariance. So del F del P dp or del F del P dq, uh, that we can write it down as zero, which is our uh, so-called loading condition. And uh, uh, similarly, we can come up with the unloading condition. But the thing is that uh, many a times, it is not always elastic, perfectly plastic. What we have, have noticed that there is a hardening, softening behavior also exists in the soil. So how it happens? So as if we are on the final yield surface, that means our loading condition is there, but uh, we can still able to increase or decrease the amount of load. How it is possible? That means there is some change in the size of the yield surface. Previously, we talked about the size of the failure surface, which is kind of a constant. But it may change, and that change comes into picture when we have a hardening or softening. Sometimes it can grow in increase or it can decrease also. But please remember, uh, remember whether it is a hardening or softening, as long as you are on the yield surface, you cannot cross it. You have to stick on the yield surface. The yield surface rather shrink or expand, keeping the stress condition at that uh, position. Okay. Uh, only thing we can lift the yield surface in only during the unloading scenario. So this is the feature we, can, we have shown here. This is uh, as if the mode coulomb or tracker packet type of failure criteria in QP space. This line uh, is representing the uh, body. Yeah, so this uh, 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 line represents the yield condition. And as if this yield surface is expanded uh, by either by changing its the slope of the yield surface, that means your friction angle changes, and or by it, it can be uh, changing your uh, the condition of the, the C or the uh, cohesion intercept can also be changed here. So these are the different ways we can model the hardening or softening. Different ways in the sense we know that uh, when you have a uh, condition that we have doing elastically and then yield and then we reach to a peak point and then there is a softening response. Now, if you calculate your friction angle considering the peak stress, you will have a different friction angle. And if you considering a peak, I mean, friction angle, which is a little bit below or a little bit above, you have a different friction angle. That means your friction angle is keep on uh, changing. So this is one way by changing the friction angle, you can incorporate kind of a softening hardening uh, response. And there is an alternative way uh, by changing the cohesion intercept also can be changed to incorporate the hardening uh, behavior. But essentially, these kind of changes are primarily dependent on your plastic strain because you already reached the yield surface so uh, or the failure or uh, you are going towards the failure. So when you reach the yield, beyond that, anything will happen. It is governed by your plastic strain. So these hardening softenings are functions of your plastic strain. So that is uh, noted down. Well, so this is a generalized condition of uh, yield surface. So previously we defined when it is elastic, perfectly plastic, your yield is only a function of stress alone. But now uh, in order to incorporate the hardening behavior, we uh, in, incorporate one uh, variable, which is known as internal variable and which is uh, denoted by the shy. And the shy is primarily a function of the plastic strain as I mentioned, okay? And this is the yield surface condition. So it is less than equal to uh, zero. That means less than zero means you are elastic and zero means you are on the sticking of the yield surface. Now the size of this yield surface can grow depending on this uh, shape of this shy or this uh, internal variable uh, effect. You can see this figure. It is plotted in the sigma one, sigma two. The internal uh, ellipse type of a uh, yield surface is shown as if it is a your Jacquard uh, uh, von Mises type of a failure. And it is expanded, okay, expanded towards uh, this, depending on that uh, shy variable, how it is changing. So that uh, governs your hardening or softening. And this kind of expansion uh, without changing the shape as if it is uh, homothetically expanded. That means uh, whatever your shape is, it retains the shape and, and grows uh, considering there is a hinge point at the center. This kind of expansion is known as the uh, isotropic type of a hardening of the material. 
there are other type of hardening also possible uh, one is kinematic hardening also possible kinematic hardening means instead of expansion of the yield circuit the yield circuit itself start moving from one location to another location but it essentially incorporates some sort of a hardening so this is known as the kinematic hardening also there are mixed hardening is also possible now again uh, we are talking about the yielding condition so how to write it down this kind of uh, different type of yield surface so one is this isotropic as i already mentioned where uh, your yield surface size depends on this internal variable and uh, otherwise it is a stress dependent uh, another way to write it down kinematic hardening where your uh, size is actually not changing but the location the position is start moving you can harden there is a mixed hardening is also possible that means your uh, size as well as uh, the stress condition both are depending on your uh, soft i mean internal variable shy uh, that is a mixed hardening and uh, if it is elastic perfectly plastic then this size will not going to change the d equals to zero and your stress the threshold stress okay so here in this equation the sigma zero represents the threshold beyond which you are elastic uh, so beyond which you will going to have a plasticity so that threshold stress is the uh, sigma zero representation here note an interesting point is that uh, in case of isotropic hardening if you are uh, going up you are reaching some sort of a yield surface and uh, then as you are moving up here if you look at the downward direction that means uh, in the negative side or, or the opposite side of the yield surface there also your yield changes that means if you are going in the unloading direction your yield surface size changes or you, you if you go unloading and then stay again go to the reloading you have to travel a much bigger path when it's the isotropic hardening. Whereas in case of kinematic hardening, when you reach this point, when you unload it in the reverse direction, your size of the yield surface is never changed. So essentially the elastic domain in case of kinematic hardening is constant. And uh, in case of isotropic hardening, your elastic domain has been expanded or shrink depending on the kind of hardening scenario. Now coming to the second uh, I mean, uh, part of it, I mean, when once we define the threshold, we define what is my yield condition, uh, whether it's a loading, unloading condition, type of yielding, uh, whether it's a uh, full frigid isotropic or dynamic type of hardening, then comes to the calculation of the plasticity. Plasticity in the sense plastic strain or the permanent strain. How we can calculate it? It comes from the a term called flow rule. What its flow rule is? Now it comes from an analogy, how to calculate the plastic strain. The analogy is that, uh, let us say I have a stress strain plot and inside that stress strain plot, the area under the stress strain plot is nothing but your uh, strain energy. And if you take a derivative of that strain energy with uh, respect to stresses, you will essentially get the uh, strain out of it. Exactly the same, but this analogy is valid for the elastic condition. If I have the elastic strain energy, I can uh, take a derivative of the stress to get the elastic strain. Now, uh, in 1928, horn mices, the same horn mices criteria we talked about, uh, come up with a similar analogy that uh, uh, we may have similar, similar to elastic potential or elastic strain, we may have a kind of a surface uh, which is known as the uh, plastic potential or uh, in more advanced type of constructive modeling, we have dissipation potentials also possible. So this is essentially a strain energy, which is corresponds to the uh, permanent deformation or the energy we are uh, losing with the deformation. Okay, So that plastic potential is, uh, if we can take a derivative of that, and uh, with that, we can also have a plastic multiplier, uh, a scalar multiplier can be multiplied and to get the plastic strain out of it. Now, how to get this G that we'll talk uh, later on, but sometimes uh, in the modeling approach, sometimes this G or this plastic potential can be considered to be uh, identical to the yield surface itself. So it is uh, that it is called the associated flow. And sometimes it, if it is depending on the type of material, if it is not uh, linked to the uh, yield surface or it is different from the yield surface, then it is a non-associated. So what essentially it does, if you take a derivative of that plastic potential at any given point, 
the normal to that derivative, I mean, uh, with respect to stress, the normal to that plastic potential will give you the direction of the plastic strain of the. And this happens, uh, you can have a multiple, I mean, your, unlike your uh, yield condition, uh, you have uh, this G or the plastic potential is always moving along with your yield condition. Wherever your stress is, you can draw a yield surface along with that uh, stress. Okay. I'll show you with a figure here. Yeah. You can see it here. When we are talking about the associated flow, then your yield surface and the plastic potentials are uh, overlapping with each other. They are identical. And uh, if you talk, uh, take a normal uh, to the yield surface or the plastic potential, they are basically same. So your change in the stress is similar as the change in the plastic strain. They are uh, showing the same direction. So they are essentially the same surface and that is associated flow. And when we are talking the non-associated flow, in some of the cases, we need a different surface. What will happen? Uh, the normal to the yield surface represents the direction of your stress. And the normal to the plastic potential, this G, this red line, is uh, denoted as the your plastic uh, strain. So why these kind of differences are required? Now, you imagine in case of soil, many times we come across a situation where it is not necessarily that if you're, you are compressing and your uh, sample is also compressed. Okay, for example, a classic uh, situation is in case of dilation. When we have a soil having a dilate, dilative scenario, we are trying to compress, but it will try to expand. So your direction of the stress is not necessarily the same direction of the strain. So in similar type of situations, uh, uh, we may need a uh, different type of a uh, uh, surface to denote the plastic strain. And, and, that, that, and those are the cases where non-associated flow uh, comes into picture. So with that note, uh, since we define plastic uh, potential, there are certain rules like the a loading unloading rule we define for the yield surface. We have to also define certain rules uh, uh, for the plastic potential as well as for the yield surface in order to uh, properly define the yield, I mean, plastic strain. These three rules are complexity, normality, and uniqueness. These are primarily used for the associated type of flow. Uh, in case of uh, convexity, what it means that this blue line indicates your yield surface, and let us say I am uh, locating at a point sigma star and I'm moving towards, so inside that surface elastic and as I'm moving towards the plasticity, I reach to that uh, sigma uh, when I reach at the surface of the elasticity, okay, or the, the transition. So this transition and uh, let us say we have a plastic strain is uh, denoted by d epsilon p, okay. So the, the angle between uh, these two uh, cases should be always uh, an acute angle for all the points. Because what will happen if there is an obtuse angle between uh, these two direction, plastic strain as well as the your uh, stress direction, then what will happen? Essentially, you will have a negative energy. Negative energy means when we are talking about this all the all sorts of plastic plasticity or permanent deformation, uh, particularly in case of our uh, soil uh, perspective, these are all uh, loss of energies, okay? And this loss of energies are primarily from the frictional loss or many other uh, uh, microstructural effects, what Professor Jian was showing, uh, there must be some sort of a fracture or something. So these are all a positive loss of energy. We cannot have a negative loss of energy is possible. Okay? So that is why uh, in that sense, we can uh, say that this uh, plastic work done Okay, plastic work done is defined here, which is the change of the stresses times the uh, plastic strain should be greater than equal to zero. So in order to hold that, these two angles should be considered to be an uh, There is another condition is called the normality. Normality is same as what we, how we define the uh, plastic potential that if you take a derivative, we perpendicular to the plastic potential. So uh, delta epsilon p must be point outward of the normal to the yield surface. For the edges has to, I mean, if there is a corner, then we have to find it out. Uh, it has to be between the normal and the neighboring points. And there's a uniqueness in the solution. So for a 
given amount of stress, you have to have a given amount of strain or plastic strain. Okay, so that has to be also should be followed. So these are the three conditions should be followed. Now, uh, this is a unique situation uh, for the uh, modeling purpose. We know it's known as the stress uh, dilatancy relationship. Since I mentioned, we are often more I mean familiar or or uh, it is easier for soil uh, modeling uh, in terms of the instead of handling the all the uh, six different stresses of six different uh, strain components is it uh, very easy to model in terms of the volumetric strain as well as the deviatory strain because that easily defines your uh, change of the volume as well as the change of the shape of the uh, sample then uh, it is easier for uh, us for the modeling purpose to define a term called the stress dilatancy relation why it is important because this is the term which often allow us to uh, model that plastic potential. We talked about plastic potential, though we don't know how plastic potential actually looks like. We just define a function, but how this looks like. But that can be somehow determined uh, from this uh, stress dilatancy relationship. What does it mean? It is nothing but the ratio between the volumetric plastic strain to the uh, deviatory plastic strain or distortion of plastic strain. Okay? We can get plastic potential out of it. Uh, from the experiments, we can find, we may figure it out what is this relationship sometimes, and that helps us to define what, uh, if we can integrate uh, this equation, whatever is obtained. Generally, it is also a function of your stresses also. So that means the stress ratio or friction angle. So from there, we can derive our uh, plastic potential from this stress dilatancy relationship. Now, this is a very much an open research area. Various people, I mean, if you have a, some sort of a soil which behavior is not a very unique, uh, like a regular one, then people are trying to find out new constitutive models. In those cases, uh, this stress dilatancy relationship, whatever you are obtaining from your experiments is very useful uh, for the modeling purposes. Now, with that note, we more or less identified what are the key components for modeling plasticity in general, not necessarily for the soil, and for the soil also, we need this uh, stress dilatancy relationship. So what are those components? We have uh, decomposition of the strains. That means strain is decomposed in plastic and plastic. We have elastic relationship, which Professor Motion already talked, talked about. So stress is multiplied uh, equal to the elastic strain. So this E denotes the elasticity, the small, uh, the subscript E is the elasticity. Elastic stiffness multiplied by elastic strain. At this moment, you may ignore this initial notations i, j, k, l and consider only d sigma equal to d e over d h seven e. We have a failure. Uh, if it is a perfectly plastic, then failure equals to zero and uh, uh, all is equal to zero. We should have a consistency condition. That means uh, del f del sigma d sigma equals to zero, but we already talked about the loading scenario and we have a flow rule. So with all these one, two, three, four, five components, we can come up with this uh, definition or the uh, shape of this elastoplastic stiffness, which was the ultimate stiffness uh, definition that we need to complete the stress strain relationship that we are after. Now, uh, these equations can be slightly changed depending on if you have hardening, then your uh, yield condition or the failure uh, have uh, this, this sort of, sorry, this is not a failure, this should be the yield, and this yield also a function of that so-called internal variable, which determines the size of your yield surface and the associated derivatives of it uh, can be used. And altogether, we can find it out the uh, total uh, elastoplastic stiffness. Now, I have a little bit of a mathematics. I'll quickly go, run over it. So we already defined this elastic, I mean, the consistency condition, which is this del f del sigma, uh, d sigma plus del f del psi, the internal variable psi equals to zero. The elastic relationship can be written as DE equals to total strain minus the plastic strain. And we also already have the flow rule. Uh, the internal variable, as I mentioned, is primarily dependent on the plastic strain. So it can be replaced with uh, the strain rule, uh, del psi equals to uh, del epsilon P del D epsilon P. And the term, uh, this is a term we are, I'm just denoting for the sake of simplicity, this is del F, del psi, del psi, del P and del G del sigma as H. Why it is required? Because in the previous equation, if you look at it here, we have this D psi is here. That can be 
uh, written as this equation here, where we can replace this dx as uh, this one, this dx d epsilon p, and this d epsilon p can be replaced with the flow rule. So altogether, we can come up with uh, this uh, particular term, which uh, we can simplify in the term as minus h. So this is what the elasticity and elasticity we can uh, replace. Uh, I mean, here in the D, in the consistency condition, and by uh, rearranging the whole thing, replacing with the simplified value, uh, we can finally come up with uh, two things. One is what is the size of, or what is the nature of this D delta lambda, which gives us the uh, plastic strain uh, amount because we already have the di uh, direction of the plastic strain from this DGD sigma, and this delta lambda is calculated. And altogether from the flow loop, we can get what is the amount of plastic strain out of it. And if all the plastic strains are again replaced in our original uh, elastic equation, Dash, I think you got disconnected in between. And you are muted also. We can't hear. Just a minute, probably. I think we need to change the control. Just give us a minute. Can you try to speak up once more? No. Yeah. Uh, so far it is good, Moshumi. I don't know. I'm, I didn't hear. We, we we were even before that we lost control. Uh, can you just go back? At least we were not able to. We didn't see this one also. Uh, yes, we were here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so far, it is good. I mean, I don't know. I have not uh, got any response from anybody. So I'm just continuing. For us, it is perfectly all right. We are enjoying the lecture. Thank you so much. Please go okay. ahead. Okay. So uh, to continue from here, so what we are doing, uh, we are trying to figure out the, uh, the elastoplastic stiffness. That is our uh, main goal out of it because we already set it up. What are the main components of uh, plasticity equations? So. Uh, in order to do that, we replace this consistency condition with all the ingredients like flow rule as well as this hardening rule, this H. Uh, we replaced it. And uh, as we, sorry, yeah, as we progress further, we can define a, again, just for the simplicity, we can define this term del of del sigma dv dg as a HC term. And altogether, we can get a uh, delta lambda or this plastic multiplier, which gives us the, uh, the magnitude of the plastic strain and, and, uh, we get the total uh, plastic strain when we replace delta lambda in the flow rule equation. This is once you, I mean, I'm going it very fast, but if you look any standard textbook also, this is very simple steps uh, to follow just by using these three things. One is the consistency condition, uh, one is the flow rule, and another is the elasticity. 
uh, that is sufficient. And uh, once we have the plastic strain, we can put it in the elastic equation back where uh, we have this so-called flow rule and can be used in the, in the place of this, uh, uh, just a moment. Yeah. We can use, uh, it is in the plastic strain uh, in the flow rule and if we replace it uh, all together, we can get the final form of the elastoplastic stiffness. Now this is the elastoplastic stiffness we need to insert in that Gauss point or the integration point that I showed very early that finite element mesh and there are integration points. There, we need to insert this elastoplastic stiffness in order to get the, uh, the stress-strain relation, whether it's a strain control or strain con stress control, depending on that, we get the response in those boundary value problems. So that is more or less the uh, kind of an objective uh, here. Now we'll uh, discuss a little bit of specific type of a model. So this discussion or this elastoplastic stiffness formation is to some extent a very generalized formation. It can be used for any metal or any other uh, plasticity formation because so far we have not talked plasticity here I and mean soil here. So to be very specific now, if we go to the soil models, how the soil models looks like. So for example, this is our uh, very familiar Mohr Coulomb model, which is a elastic, uh, perfectly plastic type of a model but it is a non-associated model. Why will come into picture? So again, uh, our criteria was that we need an elastic uh, response. So in this case, the elastic response is, a, we are using generally the linear elastic response where uh, you have two parameters as uh, uh, the motion also mentioned, either uh, your modulus and uh, Poisson's ratio, or we can replace in terms of bulk modulus and shear modulus where your bulk modulus is related, related to the mean stress and the volumetric strain, as well as the distortional strain uh, and uh, uh, derivative stress is related to the uh, shear modulus. We need a yield condition. So here your yield condition is uh, written as Q minus MP, which is exactly same as uh, your uh, tau equals to sigma tan phi, what we use in case of uh, our uh, general undergraduate uh, understanding. Only thing is this M is nothing but our uh, function of the friction angle. Now, in this material, we need to have a plastic potential which is slightly different from the yield condition. Why it is? Let us see an example here. Example is uh, we put it in a QP plane. Q is derivative stress and P is the uh, mean stress. And uh, this black line indicates your uh, yield condition. Okay. Since the elastic perfectly plastic, the position or the size or anything, nothing will going to change uh, in this line. But as we know, if we take a derivative, because if we consider it associated, we need to take a derivative of the yield condition itself to find it out the plastic strain. Since it is elastic perfectly plastic, its slope will not going to change. Any point, if you take the derivative, irrespective of whatever you do, you will always end up with the same direction or same amount of uh, plastic, strength, same direction of the plastic strain, which is actually not true because as we have seen, for example, if we are using a granular material, depending on whether it's a dense condition or loose condition, you will end up with in a different, different locations of your, uh, uh, I mean, or depending on the confinement also, you, you can end up with a different threshold point. And is each of these threshold point uh, depending on the type of material, loose or tense, your amount of plasticity will be different. So, uh, which cannot be possible through this associated type of scenario and we end up with a non-associated type of a scenario. And how it can be done? It can be done by simply introducing a similar type of a factor. Here it is M and this is M star, but the equational, the functional form looks like F and G are similar, but we have a two different parameters. This M star is coming from the is not popularly known as the, uh, the parameter which is related to your digestion type of a property. Okay. And if we get the stress dilatancy relationship for uh, this particular model, which is basically the ratio of the volumetric plastic to the volumetric uh, deviated, it is minus M star. Okay. If you take any of the standard uh, finite element code, uh, which could be plexus, abacus, or anything, so this M and M star is generally calibrated, uh, one is from the friction angle phi, another is uh, through the dilation angle psi. That's how uh, this, this can be 
model. Now, quickly, how what are the different parameters? So we need we need basically four parameters to model all those things. Four parameters means two elastic parameters a and g, and two uh, frictional parameters m. Uh, sorry, the plasticity parameter, the rate parameter. One is this m, another is this m star. So this is a typical plot I'm showing for a sand uh, having different initial uh, void ratios, but having the tests were done, the grain triaxial test has been done on a same confining pressure, but uh, since they are performed uh, on different different densities, so essentially they will end up with uh, uh, different plastic behavior depending on its relative density, whether it is a dense or uh, dilative or compactive type of a behavior. And if you see the stress strain, I mean the strain response, the volumetric stress response, for example, uh, in this case, uh, they are also uh, quite uh, different for different cases. Now, the, the interesting part is that since this model having four parameters, uh, we have no way to model all these three curves or all different densities to model with the same two parameters. So essentially what we have to do, we have to model them separately. I mean, though it's the same soil, but depending on the relative density, uh, your M and M star will going to change. M star will going to change, and all those things, all of them, we need to model uh, separately. For example, it will behave like a uh, elastic, perfectly plastic. So it will be this red line followed by this, uh, this green line uh, or the blue line followed by this, depending on the type of or the density. And how to get the M star value? So this uh, uh, threshold value in the stress strain plot will give you the m and the slope uh, of this uh, volumetric to axial not necessarily axial you can plot it in terms of derivative strain also uh, will give you the stress dilatancy relationship so this slope will to some extent help you to get the m star value or the dilation parameter so this way we can simply calibrate uh, this material uh, the things will be slightly tricky if you have an undrained test. Undrained test response in different uh, uh, void ratios uh, will look like this type of a shape, having again same confining pressure, but we are doing undrained test on a sand of different confined and different uh, initial uh, densities. Then things will be uh, like uh, the uh, shape uh, shown here. The top part is showing the stress chain response, and unlike the volumetric response, because you remember the the definition or the boundary condition I set it up earlier for hundred days the volumetric response is zero there should not be any change of volume so essentially we need to plot either pore pressure uh, change or the stress path so from the slope of this uh, stress path we can get the m value uh, elasticity we can get from the initial part of the sample here the elastic uh, properties however to determine m star uh, it's like slightly tricky. We need to plot the pore pressure and uh, to get it uh, through a trial and error method. However, there is no direct way to calibrate the M star value here. At least I am not aware of it. Train test much easier to calibrate, but undrained is not that simple uh, for these cases. So uh, now uh, with that note, uh, we come into uh, another uh, feature of soil. So before that, if you look at this particular uh, plot here, the experimental plot, you can you can see that as we are uh, loading it further, as if all these plots are going to merge uh, uh, towards the same uh, location, irrespective of your initial void ratios. Okay, so this is a very specific or typical feature that uh, soil possesses uh, that is known as the critical state. Okay, so. What does it mean? So uh, I copied it from uh, text uh, uh, from, uh, from one of the famous researcher or professor, uh, David Meru. It says that uh, critical state is nothing but these are uh, some sort of an asymptotic state in which uh, the shearing of the soil uh, can continue without any change of the volume or uh, uh, kind of an effective stress of density. The, the exact nature of the fabric uh, of the soil at critical state is not very clear. So this is a open research type of scenario. It is clearly intended that at any uh, initial interparticle bonding should have been broken down to that particle and all are all individual free to move and rotate. So uh, eventually depend irrespective of what is your uh, initial void ratio. Once you keep on loading, you will reach a situation where uh, your 
Is it not like that you will, you will always going to compress or you always going to expand? The particles will start rolling each other. So some of the places your voids are I mean, collapsing and some of the places voids are increasing. Overall, the volume will not going to change at that state. So if you have to model a, a sand or a clay perfectly, you have to take into account that uh, this kind of a critical state approach uh, for your uh, model. Okay. So what uh, how you determine this thing so this is a plot uh, uh, in one axis we have a v v is nothing but the uh, specific volume which is one plus void ratio you can interpret in terms of void ratio in the vertical axis horizontal axis it's a p p is nothing but our uh, mean stress and this dotted line indicates the uh, critical state line so critical state line is not a result of a single test but it is a result of a multiple test carried out and when you reach the final point you join all those final points in this uh, space of PV space, uh, we can get the critical state. Now, depending on uh, whether you are in a dense state or whether in a loose state, you will jump into this critical state accordingly. For example, if it is a loose state, you are coming from the top to bottom. And if it is a dense state, you are going from the bottom to top to achieve this final critical state. So at the end of the day, this you can call it as a so-called failure where you have to uh, reach and all the irrespective of your initial condition you need to reach uh, to this scenario now with that note i'm going to cover a, a special type of a, a model here so uh, how to model this uh, type of critical state a simple analogy can be given in this way for example uh, let us say a couple of particles are there and uh, they are rooting with uh, each other uh, over uh, each another so if they are rolling they can either completely close this uh, void spaces and the compress and if they further roll it, it will actually increase the uh, void spaces. So depending on your initial condition, things will either uh, from the first figure to the second or second to the first. So either they are dense or they are uh, loose condition. Now, if we think about simply the direction or the displacement in the X direction and the Y dis uh, displacement, so if we are only putting X in the horizontal and Y, Depending on your loose and dense, the situation will go up and down. The same situation can be interpreted in our uh, uh, regular uh, direct shear type of a test condition. So what we can write it down just for an analogy, uh, the work done uh, is nothing but the normal load times the delta y, which is uh, when it is going downward direction. And uh, in, in order to have in this direct shear test, we are having a uh, horizontal displacement uh, with this uh, sharing load Q, so Q into delta X is the total. Now, since the primary mechanism is the frictional dissipation, we can write it down, mu P dx is here. Now, if you did simply divide it by everything uh, uh, here by dx, and we can figure it and come up with uh, this relationship del Y del X equal to mu minus Q by P, which alternatively we can write is tan psi equals to tan of psi m minus uh, psi c, where this uh, psi is uh, uh, to some extent your uh, representation of the dilation angle. Okay, and this psi c is nothing but your critical state uh, angle finally what will happen. Okay, and pi m is the mobilized uh, friction step. The same can be uh, analyzed in a uh, sawtooth mechanism, as if uh, in the direct shear test, the sample having the sawtooth type of uh, scenario and uh, uh, they are all uh, inclined have an angle of psi and uh, the pi m the mobilized friction angle uh, is uh, showing it here and the critical state is uh, shown here so then this psi x or delta x can be analogous to the deviated extreme uh, delta y is nothing but your uh, mean stress mean uh, strain or the volumetric uh, strain q is related to the deviated stress and p is the volumetric stress so altogether, uh, we can rewrite the previous uh, equation in uh, in this form, uh, del P, del Q, the, uh, the strain ratio, the volumetric strain to the deviated strain is M minus Q by P, or it is M minus Q. So this essentially gives a notion of the uh, stress dilatancy relationship uh, that can take into account the critical state uh, behavior. So previously, when we modeled that elastic perfectly elastic mode Coulomb, our stress dilatancy relationship was just minus m star. Now we can, with this analogy, 
can build a little bit of an advanced type of a model uh, having uh, can stick into account the critical state of the, of the picture. Uh, with that note, we come to the uh, a, a different type of a model. We so far talked about the uh, uh, sandy type of material or granular material. So we are now uh, talking about a bit of the clay type of material. So modeling of the clay is uh, uh, one of the famous models that has been uh, developed by uh, Stokely and in 1968. They developed in Cambridge, so that's why on Cambridge clay, which is known as the CAM clay model. So a couple of uh, uh, key points of this uh, CAM clay model is uh, denoted here. So there is, as usual, there exists a yield surface, which is obvious, and all the stress state inside the yield surface is uh, kind of a elastic. And uh, uh, there is a nonlinear stress strain law because uh, in case of uh, soil, uh, particularly clay, we know that when we are plotting or we are performing the consolidation test, we generally plot in E log P space. Okay. So the primary purpose when we are putting the log in E log P curve, we know that it will going to behave as a nonlinear behavior. That's why in the case of cam clay, uh, it is the nonlinear elasticity comes into picture, and uh, the the stress strain, plastic strain increment uh, of the gradient also yield locus it will follow. So it's a normality rule will prevail. So essentially, uh, associated flow condition is considered here. So the yield surface is considered in such a way that it is not only associated but it also takes care of the so-called uh, dilative as well as the compressive type of behavior. Coming to some of the typical cases. Now, when you're talking about the clay, it is the OCR value. Previously, when you sand, when we, we were discussing about only the uh, density. Now, in clay, is the OCR value. Now, if you look at the OCR value, these are changing from one to four to eight. Does it mean one means is a normally consolidated? So, these red dot lines are so the drain test response is showing the normally consolidated value. And as the OCR is increasing, as we have Seen earlier also, there is a peak followed by a drop. So it's a softening or brittle type of response is happening, having with the OCR of eight. Similarly, if we are uh, checking with the volumetric stress strain response, the higher OCR value uh, gives a dilating response, and the lower OCR value or the normally consolidated gives a compressive type of response. So uh, if we just note that all these yielding points. Here in these plots, for example, this OCR 1, 2, uh, 4, and 8. And if we start joining all those yielding points, that will essentially form the yield surface uh, for this model. So, how to do that? Now, uh, before going into there, as we are discussing about this E log P space and the critical state, the same thing now can be plotted in this way, where in the horizontal axis we have a log. Instead of uh, log 10, we are putting into the uh, natural log. And the vertical axis is E. Sometimes it's a specific void, or the void ratio can be plotted. Now, this is exactly the same as the consolidation test scenario, where you have a <coughs> one. Uh, this first part is your loading and loading curve, which is the decompression line you can think of. The next part is nothing but one over lambda, which is the iso NCL or normal consolidation line, <coughs> and the CSL is located somewhere here. Now, the assumption is that to some extent, the, the slope of the CSL or the critical state line is same as the iso NCL line shown here. So, the equations are uh, uh, given here, the equations of each and every line. So, elasticity is represented by this recompression line or the so-called uh, URL line, the unloading reloading line, uh, which is in the second equation here, and only the parameter K is here. The iso NCL line is represented by the first equation where this lambda is written. Now, this k and lambda, these are the two parameters uh, are uh, very closely related to our uh, compression uh, index, uh, which we are generally calculated uh, calculating from the consolidation test. So, these are easy to calibrate in that way. Elasticity response, unlike our sand response here, the k or the uh, volumetric response is a function of P, uh, which is very clear from the second equation because it's already a nonlinear equation. So your void ratio to P 
uh, is giving a nonlinear equation through this uh, logarithmic nonlinearity. So essentially, the volumetric uh, strain or the elastic volumetric strain is a function of p, or your bulk uh, stiffness is basically a function of uh, p. Whereas the uh, shear stiffness is a linear shear stiffness element. And here we can use a hardening. Hardening in the sense we discussed that how the yield surface grows or shrinks. That depends on your the history of the material, how it is, uh, what is the pre-consolidation pressure. So this is the pre-consolidation pressure equation. I'm not going to do a derivation. At least you can um, appreciate that. For example, uh, if you are loading from this point E0 and all the way we went to uh, the point uh, somewhere here, EC0, and then this is our initial pre-consolidation pressure, EC0. And then we load it further, then we follow the normal compression line, and then we reach somewhere this PC. So this is your upgraded uh, line. Now you can see if we start unloading, is unloading the, the size of the yield surface is somehow you can appreciate from here uh, or complete from here that this is increased. So somehow your yield surface previously was this PC0, now it moved to here. So your yield surface actually expands. So this PC is nothing but governing the so called the hardening. And this is, uh, as we mentioned, this is always uh, we generally express in terms of plastic strain. So PC is a function of the plastic strain. So these are the uh, four parameters that we can see. One is the uh, uh, EC0 point uh, uh, we have to figure it out. And uh, the lambda, K, 3G, these are the um, parameters. So the final form of this yield surface, unlike the previous case when we have only a straight line was there uh, in case of Mohr Coulomb, in this case is a uh, elliptic type of a yield surface. And in this yield surface, in one side, the right hand side the for the compressive side, and the left hand side is nothing but the dilating type of a side. Uh, this point denotes the PC, where which guide the change in the surface, whether the surface will shrink or surface will expand, that depends uh, on this PC. And whatever will happen, the, finally the yield surface, the loading, the stress path will finally reach this critical straight line, which is generally denotes by the, the top points of point of this uh, critical straight line. There are few development of this cam clay model. Initially there was the original cam clay model and then there was some issues with that uh, and um, numerical issues as well as the uh, uh, prediction issue, then it was modified to this uh, so called uh, modified Cantley or known as the MCC type of model. So, here is one more parameter we need to calibrate. This is the M. Again, this M is function of your friction uh, angle. So, with that note, we are just uh, almost uh, at the end. So, we are quickly going over the response of uh, some of the material. Let's say if we are talking about the drain. Uh, triaxial test response. And we're going to now look into all sorts of uh, uh, possible features. That means, uh, let's say we are talking about the lightly over consolidated. Lightly over consolidated means if we have a pre compression uh, pressure or pre consolidation pressure PC, uh, the stress at which we are giving the confinement should be very close to the that PC or at least uh, more than the half. Uh, that. So let us say this A point here, it denotes the uh, isotropic compression stress where we initially consolidated. And from here onwards, we are loading. If you are familiar with the stress path approach in soil mechanics, so this denotes how the stresses are moving. Okay. Generally, in case of drain triaxial test, the slope of the stress path is 1 over 3. Now we look uh, back and forth in two different figures. One is the top figure is the QP plane and another is the bottom figure this P versus D or this uh, uh, critical state also we can look into this volumetric uh, surface. Okay. It's actually a three dimensional plot in terms of deviated stress, mean stress and uh, uh, volumetric strain. However, we are uh, looking in a 2D surface. So what is happening as the stress is at this A point is initially uh, elastic and we are loading it, we are applying deviatoric load, it reaches to the B. B point is the first yielding happens. The moment yield happens, because of the hardening, the surface starts expanding. So it will start moving to the C, C to D, D to E, until it reaches to the final failure, 
which is located at the critical state, which is, is denoted by the dotted line. What is happening to the volumetric response? It's starting from this point A and follow a URL line initially, the loading reloading line, reach to point B, and you are, it is crossing slowly towards the final uh, failure point B, uh, through which the, yields are, uh, the critical state line will be going to move. If we look at the stress strain response, if you see from B to C what is happening, we are only plotting the post yield response here, not the elastic part. So it is kind of a hardening. You see, B, the stress is increasing. So your P, C, D, and F is hardening. And if we look at the volumetric response, your B to F it is going uh, straight this way in a unidirectional direction. So uh, there is no dilation here. So it is a compressive type of response uh, here. So this is uh, just a schematic. So this is our, our, our let us see your initial yield surface. You are located uh, here. This is your stress path. The red line is showing the stress path. Uh, how it is? These are the points we are traversing from A to B to C to D to E. Now and uh, these are the increased yield, yield surfaces given the hardening scenarios. Okay. So. If we plot it in a P V plane or the volumetric response is plotted here, we can track it down. This P, P is nothing but the uh, pre compression pressure or pre consolidation pressure that denotes the ISO NCL line. How it is changing along with the size of the yield surface, it is going this way. And this blue line represents the corresponding uh, critical state line here in the same uh, uh, surface. And we can track it down all the points denoted by uh, the critical state over the critical state line. Now, how it is moving? So these are this uh, are our so-called URL line or loading and loading line or decompression line. So from when you are locating at this point A, we are somehow going all together to this point, which is uh, somehow there. And then we slowly move into the final failure, which is located. Okay. The same way we can plot the stress strain plot. So this is initially A to B is elastic followed by uh, hardening response. And if we plot the volumetric response here, uh, it is also a compressive type of response during the this. Okay. So that's how it happened. Similarly, over consolidation ratio, if it is one, it will start from this point instead of uh, inner point, it will go up. I will not spend time on this because we already discussed it here. Uh, interesting response would be rather uh, over consolidated sign uh, clay when we are heavily over consolidated. That means your uh, isotropic compression pressure is much lower uh, than the decompression pressure. Then what will happen? Our expectation is that the sample will dilate as well as there is a chance the sample will going to show a softening type of response. So what will happen? So let us see we are starting from this point P. Uh, the loading happens, the drain triaxial test. We reach all the way first this Q point. Okay. This is the Q point we all the way reach. So this is your first yielding, the outermost surface here. And then there is a softening because we need to reach finally this yield surface or the critical state line. So we we'll all the way down along with that one over three stress path to reach the peak point. So that is exactly happening here. Just the animated way. So this is our initial yield surface. This is the volumetric stress uh, space. Our uh, pre-compression pressure. The starting point A where your uh, isotropic compression takes place. This is the loading uh, stress path. We reach to the B point. Then we are back towards the C, D and finally. E point. So as you are going it down, your yield surface is shrinking. That is why you observe some sort of a softening in case of this particular case. So this is the volumetric response. We started from here and we are going up towards this point. So you can see clearly see initially it is a compressing and then it is start dilating your uh, volume going in the upward opposite direction. So if we plot the corresponding stress strain plot, you can see first it is going B and then C. So this is the softening response here. And in this case, if we are tracking the volumetric response, initially in the elastic stage, there is a slight compression followed by then the reverse process. Okay. 
So this is uh, perhaps the last slide. So some typical uh, stress strain response uh, uh, we have taken from Bishop and Hank. So uh, this is a series of uh, drain triaxial test as well as the undrain triaxial test response, and the stress paths are plotted here. If you only notice the last points of every test, all these four tests, the last point is D here for the second test, it is H here, third test is N, and the fourth test is the S here. Uh, we can actually map those stresses on a same line. So that means this define your critical state. The corresponding to the volumetric response of this last point, if we map it on the void uh, ratio versus P, this uh, hatched portion. Uh, gives you the critical state line uh, here in the volumetric response. Okay. If you look at it, the, the data carefully, you see in some of the cases you have a pore pressure as there. So those are the tests where undrain test uh, happens, and the other two tests are basically uh, drain test in different different findings. So this was more or less the brief introduction uh, of the soil plasticity without uh, going into the detail of the derivations of it, I just try to cover uh, two types of models. One is uh, more Coulomb and uh, one is the uh, chemical model and how to kind of calibrate the, the different parameters uh, from the stress strain responses, uh, why and how to de derive plasticity, what are the key components of the plasticity that I'm trying to touch upon. These are some of the textbooks. I mean, uh, uh, if you are interested, you can go through it. Uh, I have learned uh, uh, many things from plasticity from this uh, chain and hand plasticity structural mechanics. So this is a uh, more towards the structural part, but it covers a quite great detail of the plasticity. In general, for soil plasticity, the two very good books are there is by uh, Professor David Meyerwood, and also uh, more detail you can and this consider to model by uh, Alexander Okay, so with that note, I'm uh, ending the talk. So hope you enjoyed and learned something. Okay, so thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Das, for uh, such an insightful presentation on soil plasticity in such a short time. I'm sure uh, all the participants will be like it will be a booster for all the participants to learn this uh, substitutive modeling who are working in this field. So thank you, thank you very much. So the floor is open for question and answer now. Any question? Anybody? If you have any question, please, you can raise your hand and unmute yourself. Anyone have any question you can ask? Yeah, there are some. Thanks, Dr. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Patel has a question. There are yeah. two maps I can see. So Madhusudan is uh, giving them permission to. Yeah. You have to unmute them. Unmute them. If you can unmute yourself, we have given the permission. Thank you so much, Dr. Das, for such a detailed presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is, um, can you give some practical examples um, indicating the significance of different types of the hardening? Something similar to what you uh, explained uh, by giving classical example for uh, explaining the difference between associative and non-associative non flow rule? Uh, hardening, uh, I still don't get the practical example means you, what are the other different type of hardening? You... I mean, uh, what could be the practical scenario as a result of which we have four different types of hardening? Um, in the sense, why, like, why do we have uh, kinematic hardening different than that of oh, isotropic okay. hardening? Uh, okay, okay, those are okay. So, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, the very classic example for isotropic hardening is in general for regular purpose, uh, the static response of the soil or monotonic response, if I say, we mostly come across the isotropic hardening. 
but kinematic response kinematic hardening is mostly observed in case of a cyclic loading so whenever mm -hmm. in case of a soil particularly when we are testing with for its uh, knowing the liquid action potential or or the shear modulus degradation uh, to determine we notice that the size of the yield surface uh, or the the elastic domain is very limited for the soil and and during the unloading itself okay generally we consider that when it is unloading there is elasticity happen but that is generally not true in case of uh, most of the soil undergoes the dynamic loading so when it goes for the unloading it quickly uh, goes towards the plasticity and in order to uh, capture that uh, many times we need the kinematic hardening in majority of the cases we need the kinematic hardening to uh, use it not only that in case of besides the earthquake scenario in case of uh, road pavement where uh, there is a cyclic traffic loads are going uh, we need to calculate sometimes those resilient modulus so in those cases also uh, many times kinematic hardenings are also uh, used now uh, these are simple way to do that but uh, in reality it is basically happening with the mixed uh, hardening so both kinematic as well as the uh, many of the sand it is actually showing some of the increase in the size of the surface and coming back during the cyclic loading so Mixed hardening is more uh, advanced type of thing. And the last is elastic perfected plastic is uh, generally not seen anywhere, but this is for the simplicity, like the molecular model uh, I have uh, discussed. Uh, that is for the simplicity, our uh, sake of simplicity, we are using the elastic perfected plastic. Oh, wow. that, uh, yeah, it does answer, answer my question. And in fact, uh, in practical field, it is generally the uh, perfectly plastic kind uh, of models the, which are generally yeah. adopted if you yeah. don't have any sophisticated tool or or anything uh, for the easy calculation uh, elastic perfect plastic sometimes very helpful right uh, and i have a second quick question um so as i understand most of these models are based on the macroscopic behavior of soil Okay. So, can you comment on the applicability of these models on the microscopic behavior of soils? I mean, I'm just curious, like, are, do, I, do you think they're applicable or in the first place, do we really need to explore um, or predict the microscopic behavior of soil? No, so I put the question differently. So, generally, mm -hmm. uh, so these are continuum models, which are meant to uh, model the macroscopic response uh, there are models available uh, i mean so what we and what professor uh, jiang was also in the morning mentioning so we are basically learning from the microscopic understanding so at the grain to grain contact what is happening or how the clay platelets are moving over another in the clay and from that understanding we try to develop these models. So, for example, in some of the cases, these hardening features we are uh, we are using pre-consolidation pressure is a hardening, or we are using some sort of a dilation. Uh, there sometimes we use hardening by changing. In case of Drucker pegger it is popularly used. The the cohesion intercept is sometimes changing to incorporate hardening. But these are kind of a superficial. I mean, uh, it's a it's a phenomenologically we are doing. But microscopic understanding, if you have that can be very much useful to prepare a more advanced hardening uh, feature or advanced not only hardening I mean the, um, the, the the elasticity response and the advanced elasticity response uh, can be used so uh, to answer your question we generally don't use these models for microscopic response rather than the other way around we use the microscopic knowledge to enhance these models mm -hmm. right okay yeah, that answers my question. Probably by incorporating some sort of a parameter or something. Yes, some, either some or some mm -hmm. other uh, rules. What Professor Jiang was mentioning is some sort of a rules we need to find it out uh, so that we can link them. The the, the change in at the microscopic uh, level or at the grain level, what is happening directly reflected uh, at the macroscopic level. So that's okay. okay. Probably, I mean, it was a redundant question because I somehow missed the session by Dr. Jiang. But yeah, thank you so much for answering my questions. So we have another question here from Govind, Mr. Govind. Okay. 
so first of all thank you very much uh, sir for such an explanatory session uh, sir my first question is that in one of the slides you have mentioned that the plastic flow starts long before the irrigation so are there any characterization that uh, shows that the initiation of that particular plastic flow before the irrigation any characterization change before the yielding yes in slide number 21 you have mentioned no bef not before the yielding before the failure oh began before the failure yes sir yes it's okay. before the failure so i mean one way uh, if i can uh, try to put your answer in this way if you look follow this particular plot uh, is very hard to see where is the failure or sorry what is the yielding because yes. uh, curve is so non-linear from the beginning itself, so we don't know. So uh, generally, uh, there are models available where people are trying to model even without any elasticity. I mean, elasticity only uh, is there during the unloading stage. Otherwise, during the loading stage itself, uh, it is uh, always going to have elasticity. Some sort of a hyper, uh, hypo, um, hmm, hypoplastic type of models are available to do that. So completely ignore the elasticity and starting from the very beginning. And that is happening in the soil. If you slightly deform it, it will deform. You don't need any uh, notional elasticity in the, in the soil. When a grain moves a certain amount, a small amount, you cannot revert it back. It's already moved. So there is already a plasticity. So sometimes that way, but of course, elasticity is required for the unloading uh, purposes. Uh, you need the elasticity. And sir, uh, one my question is that uh, in one of the slides you have mentioned that mm -hmm. regarding the angle between the sigma B and sigma, where you have mentioned that the obtuse angle uh, so results in the negative energy. So yeah. the, I want to know about the physical significance in the reality. What is so negative energy? Negative, negative energy means I was uh, trying to mention. Look, uh, majority of the source of this plasticity is frictional uh, energy. Yes. Okay. Or frictional loss. Mm -hmm. so, so let us say in this particular figure, if you look at this mass, if oh. this mass is going forward or this mass is going backward, you are accumulating, you are losing energy, no matter whether you are going forward or backward. Yes. But it is not true for the this spring. If you are mm -hmm. compressing the spring or expanding the spring, you are uh, storing energy or releasing it. But in case of friction, whether you are going forward or backward, you are always losing. Isn't it? Yes, so in that in the same sense, so there is no negative in that sense. There is no negative plastic in plastic uh, energy or negative work done, plastic work done. Okay. Okay. So yes. you have to have a positive in that sense. Okay. Sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for asking this question and section. If you have any more question, any participant. Yes, sir, but I have one question. Please go. Please should ask. Uh, first of all, thank you, sir, for such a good explanation about the modeling. Uh, I want to ask that uh, while you were telling the hardening behavior, you told that it was a. Hello. Hello, hello, I'm audible. I think I, 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 I didn't hear you the last part of the question. Uh, while you were discussing the hardening model, you told that it was a hyperbolic behavior. I want to know, uh, is it always the same and how does it um, uh, Which one, the Camkley you were talking about? The hardening model. The hyperbolic behavior of hardening model. Do you remember the slide? Which because I, I discussed only one. Uh, this camply only I discussed about the hardening. This is one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, you told that it was hyperbolic behavior uh, while discussing in a slide. Um, maybe I I said something wrong. So it is a. Uh, so the technically what is happening how this p is changing or this pc so 
So your ISO NCL line, how it is changing with the, uh, this uh, uh, void ratio or the volumetric strain, that is what it is. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. 